Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us um, on today's Lunch with Haley. I'm Michelle McCormick. I'm a social media marketing advisor here at Haley Marketing, and I'm joined by Dan Hong. He is our SEO advisor. And today we're going to talk to you about staffing messaging, and we'll teach you how to strike a balance between human readers and search engine algorithms. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today is why messaging strategies are necessary, how staffing messaging has changed. Uh, we're going to look at SEO from an overview and its effect on messaging. We'll talk about how to create a messaging strategy. Um, we're also going to talk about how to implement SEO into this messaging strategy. And then at the end, we're going to tie it all together with a few examples. So why are messaging strategies necessary? Your staffing firm needs a messaging strategy in order to keep everyone on the same page. And this goes from sales to recruiting to your clients, to your candidates, even to your competitors. Clear and compelling messaging shows who you are, how you're different, how you're better, and why everyone should choose you over your competition. We want to talk about the different people that you should target with this message. And your message needs to be tailored to the people that you're speaking to. So if this is clients, maybe you are um, talking to the CEO, a hiring manager, um, someone in HR, floor manager, CIO, and then candidates could be across the board for, from forklift drivers, travel nurses, software developers, machine operators, and call center reps. So we want to talk about how staffing messaging has changed. And um, really the idea for this webinar came from um, Staffing World. Last October, I was lucky enough to attend it, and the American Staffing Association did this really great job um, putting a lot of resources, time, and money into this study that um, used focus groups to show how staffing messaging resonated with um, job seekers. It's a lot different than what we've all been taught over the past couple years, and um, we're going to go into that in the next few slides. So why messaging is so important now to candidates is because the national unemployment rate is still around 4%. And attracting candidates by giving them a positive candidate experience is very important. And that starts with the messaging that they're hearing from the very beginning. So this is a slide right from the um, ASA study. I highly suggest you go to the American Staffing Association website and um, download these for yourselves. The study, it was it was really eye-opening, and as a marketer, I felt like they almost did my job for me, where they found out um, what we should be telling our clients and candidates, and um, it's, messages like this need to be used going forward. Um, in the next slide, you'll see the website where you can find those. But we want to look at the bottom of this pyramid. Um, in the past, staffing agencies have really put the, the um, cart before the horse in a way where you they start talking about the jobs that they have rather than telling the job seeker what they need to hear first. And that's at the bottom of this pyramid. So job seekers need to find a job. That's what they want. Um, that is the most important thing to them, finding a job, having someone listen to them and be their partner and um, finding it for them quickly. So before you do anything else, your staffing agency has to address that. Then you can move up the pyramid and um, these are features that make the job special. So we know that when you are a temporary employee, you're hoping that the job you get eventually turns permanent. So you don't really have to talk about that first. Um, here is where you can talk about, though, the bridge to permanent employment, um, using the job as a way to get permanent employment. Like That's all important, but it's not as important as finding the job. Finally, you can move up the pyramid and you can talk about having a flexible schedule. So for job seekers, as you'll see um, in the next couple slides, they would hear the word flexible and that didn't, it didn't uh, relate to them. So they would hear the word flexible and think like, okay, they're flexible or the job from the client's perspective is flexible and it's not gonna be something that they're gonna stay with for a while because um, they're more of a commodity than anything else. So once you've already explained those three other or two other portions of the pyramid, you can talk about what flexibility means, um, how maybe the work uh, day is flexible for them and how it fits into their family life and things about them because as a recruiter, you already know more about them from talking to them through the rest of this process. So we want to shift the focus from the job itself and turn it to how you can make the job seeker's life easier and how you can help them throughout the process. 
Okay. So these next two um, images here are right from the study as well. I know it's a little small and hard to see, so we're going to break these down in the next couple of slides. But um, like I said at the bottom, you can download the pages at the ASA website, and I highly suggest you do this going forward. Okay, language to lose. When you say you can use this job as a stepping, stepping stone, your candidates hear that this is an empty promise. When you say to use it as an opportunity, it sounds to them like, these people don't really know me. It sounds like I've never had a job before. And then when you say, um, this job could make you more hireable, it sounds to them like they're not good enough right now. So if these are the messages that you're putting out, candidates are not gonna wanna work with you because it sounds like you don't really know them as people. So this is the language that we wanna use. When you say, we're gonna get your resume in front of the right people, they hear my resume will finally be read by a person. I won't be weeded out in ATS keywords. Um, a human will really be reading this resume, finding out my skills, and they'll be able to match me with the right job. When you say we work one-on-one -on -one with job seekers, uh, this tells them that the recruiter is trying their best to get to know them as a person. And when you say we make support services available, like interview prep or resume workshops, it sounds to them like this staffing agency is really trying to help me find a good job. And we talked about the human side of things. Now we're gonna turn it over to Dan and he's gonna tell you a little bit more about SEO. Thanks, Michelle. So for this, I really just wanted to talk about, um, you know, what is search engine optimization? How does it really work? And then how does it actually affect your messaging? So for starters, um, SEO stands for search engine optimization. And um, SEO is really the process of driving targeted traffic to your website from people who are using search engines when they're looking for products, services, information uh, that you provide. And to get a better understanding of what SEO is and how it works, we really need to understand how search engines in general work. Um, and to do that, we'll need to understand what Google's search algorithm is. So Google search algorithms are essentially a system that's designed to sort through the billions of web pages that are out there and then present them in a way where the user can find what they're looking for. So essentially, this is how it'll work. A user has a problem um, and they're gonna go to a search engine, they're gonna go to Google to try to find that answer. Google's algorithm will then sort through all the pages that it has in its index and then try to find the results that are most relevant to that user's query. Once it does that, Google will then rank these results, presenting them in order based on how likely it is to answer that person's query. And while the algorithm itself is very complex in the back end, everything boils down to that main goal of helping users find what they're looking for. So how does it actually work though? How does Google know what your content is about? And you know, while there are hundreds of different ranking factors that Google uses, um, one of the main ways that Google can gauge the relevance of a page is through the use of keywords. A keyword is essentially an idea or a topic that represents what your content is about. And more importantly, a keyword is the literal word or phrase that somebody enters into a search engine when they're looking for something. So, you know, one example of a keyword would be something like staffing agencies in Atlanta. And, you know, this is just one example of a keyword. Um, there are, you know, thousands of different keywords that people will be searching for, they'll be typing into the search engines when they're looking for the services and information that are that your company provides. So how does this actually affect your messaging, your company's messaging, and where does it come into play? Um, so the idea of keywords, um, you know, when we're optimizing a website for search engine optimization, we're doing SEO, we're strategically placing these keywords throughout the content itself. And what that does is it helps Google understand what that page is about. Um, you know, and the better Google understands the content, the easier it easier it is for them to determine if it's relevant to what that user typed in. So as you can see in this example here, um, you know, not only do we want to, if we're trying to 
targets, you know, staffing agencies in Atlanta. We don't just want to use the keyword staffing agencies in Atlanta throughout the copy. We want to think of all the different keywords and phrases that are relevant to that initial search string that will really help Google gauge the context. So as you can see here in this block of copy, you know, somebody who's searching for um, a staffing agency in Atlanta might also be looking for, you know, a recruiter or warehouse jobs or, you know, job opportunities. So these are all different types of keywords that you might want to mix throughout your content to help um, Google understand that, you know, your result is relevant to what a user might be searching for. So um, as you can see in this example here, when you optimize your website for search engine optimization, you properly identify the keywords that people are using and you incorporate them throughout your site. Um, it helps your site become visible in Google when somebody does a search. Um, and as you can see in this example here, you know, typically the higher you rank, you know, the easier it is for your content to be seen when somebody does a search and the more likely you are to um, be seen and drive traffic back to your site, essentially. So, you know, why should you care about SEO? Why does that matter? Well, the reason is, you know, there are thousands of people searching for your services and information in Google every single month. You know, so if you aren't optimizing um, your website for the keywords that your audience is searching for, you're losing out on a lot of opportunity to drive this relevant traffic back to your website. So here I have this chart that shows some of the most popular keywords that are used in the staffing industry. Um, so as you can see here, I know a lot of um, staffing firms, you know, they hate using the word temp agencies. They hate referring to themselves as a temp agency. Um, you know, but when we look at the actual data and we look at the types of keywords that, you know, your users are actually typing in when they're looking for you, you can see that this is one of the most popular keyword variations out there. So, you know, when it comes to messaging, when you're creating your messaging strategy, you should really just be mindful of the terminology that your audience is using when they're searching for your services. So now I'll hand it back over to Michelle here, who will talk about how to actually create a messaging strategy. Thank you, Dan. So at the beginning of our presentation, I had a quote up there that said, the best marketing doesn't feel like marketing. And that's what I want you to think about as we go um, forward in creating our strategies. Um, we're not going to talk about sales tactics or sales scripts. We really just want to help you figure out how you're different so you can have honest conversations about um, your brand and your business and have people want to work with you because it shows them how you want to make their lives a little bit easier. So um, we talked about candidates with the ASA data, but now we're going to talk about candidates and clients. So the first thing we want to do is uncover what makes you different. And this is what makes you truly different. What sets you apart? What makes you better, faster, or less expensive than your competition? And um, I want to tell a quick story. This happened at um, or, uh, Staffing World last October. I was sitting at a round table with um, different staffing owners, and we were talking about differentiation. And um, I said to one, like, you know, what makes you different? And immediately he said, we won best of staffing. So probably a little too rude. I said, okay, but everyone says that. What really makes you different? And after I apologized and we started talking a little bit, we found out that um, – he is the only person in his marketplace who partners with local colleges and provides training to candidates before they ever graduate. So he was in healthcare. Um, these are highly specialized candidates that really hit the ground running as soon as they graduate with these great jobs from the staffing agency. And this is really important for candidates and clients. Um, candidates are going to want to work with them because they know that they have all this preparation before they graduate. And clients know that they will hire people who are more prepared for the job than maybe working with a different staffing agency. So, you know, that is what really made them stand out. It's what they're doing that no one else is doing. And um, it makes it an easy choice for someone to choose that state staffing agency to work with based on um, that differentiation. And I think when we talk about what makes us different, sometimes we're, we're really quick to jump to the awards that we've gotten. 
And those may or may not set us apart, but really they're used to help us enhance our brand, not really make it different from someone else's. Um, and one more thing I wrote on here is, is your job placement time faster than your competitors? Maybe it takes you a day or two to fill a job when a competitor maybe takes a month. So that's a huge differentiator and it's a really big deal to clients. So if that is you, feel free to talk that up. We wanna next decide who we're targeting. And this is clients, candidates, and specific industries. So like Dan said, the word temp is okay. Um, that's what ASA learned from their research. That's what temporary employees are searching on Google. They know that they're temporary employees and they're looking for temporary jobs. So the word temp, I think in the past, we thought was a little bit almost offensive to temporary employees, but really that's what people are searching for and what they're looking for. So it is okay to call your temporary employees temps. Um, in the same respect though, you don't wanna use the word freelancer or contractor um, unless you are in an industry that uses that as um, you know, what the, the candidates are actually called. For example, the IT industry calls their candidates contractors, that's okay. But if you're outside that industry and using that type of language, it doesn't resonate well with your candidates because it, they don't think that applies to them. Um, you know, a temporary um, picker packer is not going to hear freelancer and think that that is a job for them. So keep that in mind. Um, we also wanna think about who we're targeting as far as clients, what level of the business they are in, um, candidates, what I said before with temps, contractors, freelancers, and then specific industries, you're not going to um, target travel nurses the same way you would target um, call center reps. And now we wanna make it easy for the decision maker to choose you. So why should they choose you? What can you do for them? How will you make their lives easier? And this is for candidates and clients. Um, will you make their lives easier because you're gonna provide quality candidates that aren't gonna turn over in the few months of a new job um, for candidates? Should they choose you because you're gonna give them a better job with more money and they feel like they listen to you? So in your messaging, try to keep this as concise as possible and um, be able to really show off how you can make this as easy a decision as possible. And finally, we wanna get everyone on board. And this means everyone, every piece of communication that your message will touch, we want everyone to be on the same page. So um, for starters, internally, have a company meeting to discuss your new messaging. Um, one thing we do here at Haley Marketing is we really um, are proud of our core values. There's five of them. We have posters around the building with each value on them. Um, for the holidays this year, we all got a poster to put in our cubicles. So this is something that we live and breathe every day. And if you did come into our building, you would see what our core values are and you know that this is what we live. So when you're changing your messaging, it's gonna be a big change for your entire team. And um, you wanna have at least one meeting to talk about it, probably several more. Um, but from here, you're gonna start updating your web copy, your print materials, any social media profiles you have, the language you use on social media messages, um, your business cards, your email signatures, anything that either goes to an internal team member or touches a client or candidate on the outside, you wanna make sure that's consistent. And finally, we wanna up update your website's SEO, so it's reflected there, these changes are reflected there, and um, Dan is gonna tell us how to start implementing that. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, so um, you know, now that you have your messaging strategy, you, you know, you really want to think about how you're going to optimize your website so that search engines can see that as well. So I'm kind of just going to run over some, um, you know, the basic process behind search engine optimization and what are some of the best practices without getting a, like too tactical. But essentially, the first thing you want to do is to identify your target market. You know, who are you really trying to target with your SEO? Are you trying to target candidates? Are you trying to um, target clients? Or, you know, maybe you're in a very specific industry where, you know, there are a lot of common questions that people are asking. So your goal with search engine optimization is to identify what problems um, your target audience is having. Um, you know, what questions are they asking? From there, you want to do what we call keyword research. Um, and, you know, I mentioned before what a keyword is. 
but you want to identify the actual keywords, the actual phrases that somebody would be searching for and typing in to Google when they're seeking out an answer. And then once you have those keywords um, that you want to target, that people that you know people are asking, you want to create content on your site and then incorporate these keywords throughout your site. Um, that way you can let the search engines know that you have the best answer to that question. Um, Google's number one ranking factor, and this will never change, is having high quality content on your site. Um, you know, Google's main goal is to serve their users, right? When somebody types something in, their goal is to find the absolute best result on the web that answers that question and then serve it. So, you know, once you understand the pain points of your target market, and then you create that content that solves their problem, um, Google will rank your site and you can ultimately drive more organic traffic back. Okay, so now we're going to tie all of this together with a few examples. So in the next slide, we're going to look at um, two blog posts for top-notch personnel. And these are great examples of how messaging can work and how it can really fail. Um, this is a client that Dan and I work on together. And um, they're a light industrial staffing agency in Wichita, Kansas. And we'll, we'll look at this and just see where there were some mistakes, but um, where there are some really good things. Right, so here's an example. Um, you know, they have a blogging program that they, they do with us. And here's an example of two different posts that they have um, on their site. Um, one of them is, you know, how to prove you are detail-oriented in an interview. And post two is how a mirror can help you find your job. Um, so what I really wanted to point out with this example is, you know, how search engine optimization really comes into play here. Um, so when you're identifying the pain points of your target market and what they're actually searching for, um, you want to make sure that, you know, your posts and your content is actually something that somebody would type into a search engine to find a result. Um, so as you can see in the first example, the way this title is, um, you know, it's something that somebody would realistically type in their search engine when they're looking for something. Um, then when you compare that to post number two, um, you can see that, you know, this is kind of just something that was written, something that's cool that they kind of want to get off their chest. You know, I have this cool information. Here it is. But it really isn't something that somebody would, you know, type into Google when they're looking for an answer. Um, and, you know, it's Great to, you know, write, you can write whatever you want to write or say whatever you want to say. However, you just got to keep in mind that, you know, if you're not optimizing your content around the topics that people are actually searching for, it could be the difference between post one, which brings in over 2000 visitors to the, the website every single month versus post two, which brings in only two visitors from search engines every single month. And we think those were? We think those were our clicks. <laughs> I don't even know if anyone searched for that. Um, yeah, that's <laughs> that probably me when I went to take the screenshot here. Exactly. Um, so this is how you can adjust to some messaging that might have not hit the mark. So Top Notch has a social pro program with us. So we promote their blog posts on social media, which everyone should be doing, even if you don't have social pro with us. Um, we we're able to change up some wording and make this a little bit more friendly for search engines. But this blog was actually requested by the client. A lot of their candidates would come in for interviews. They wouldn't really smile. They wouldn't be personable. So we wrote this in order to show how um, smiling in front of mirror and practicing in front of mirror would help you nail your next job interview. But um, the title didn't reflect that. Um, in, in, I'm sorry, the SEO really didn't pick that up and it wasn't effective, but you can explain the intent when you change it onto social media. And I believe we did get a question um, about that. So this kind of addresses that. How does messaging carry over into social media? And this is a really good way to do it. So you want to stay con consistent, but also um, you can explain your intent a little bit more on social posts. Um, you can change up the title to make it a little bit more reader friendly on social media. And I think this is a great crossover between 
what search engines are looking for and also what uh, the human reader is looking for. Okay, so we want to recap what we talked about today about creating your messaging strategy before we finish up here and open it up for more questions. But remember, we want to uncover what makes you different. Um, we want to decide who you're targeting so you can make your messages specific to that person. And we want you to say how you can make it easier for the decision maker to make their decision and choose you. And you need to get everyone and everything on board that also includes your SEO. So with that, we're going to open the floor for more questions. I had a question come in about um, finding the right keywords to optimize your site for. And that's a great question. And while the process is actually, you know, there's a lot to it um, to identify all the popular keywords. Um, the thing is, what you can do is really just take a look at some of the questions that you frequently get asked. And that's kind of the best way to start. It makes the best um, blog post to just find those questions that, you know, people are always asking you. You have people coming to you all the time asking these questions. So, you know, rather than just answering them one by one, you know, maybe take a blog, make a blog post out of that question um, and then put it up on your site. Okay. Um, I had one that said, uh, does my blog need to have one unique voice or can multiple people post and will this affect messaging? So I think you can have multiple people posting. Um, you want to keep your core messaging consistent. And usually um, you can do this in a call to action at the end of the blog post where you kind of sum things up and tell your readers where to go. Um, one thing you want to look at before you post are um, different keywords and search terms that you want to use for your SEO. But I think as long as those keywords are in there, the call to action is consistent, multiple, multiple people can post and it'll still sound like it came from your brand. I had a question come in, um, you know, how many keywords should you include in a blog post? And, you know, that's one way to think about it. But, you know, when I'm thinking about optimizing a blog post for search engine optimization, I really don't think about the specific number of keywords that are being used. And ne neither does Google. Google will not look at your content and say, you know, I have three keywords on here, so I should rank for this, this, and this. Um, you really want to think about it like topic coverage, right? So you want to make sure that your blog post thoroughly covers a topic. So, you know, think about what questions the person has and then answer that question and then answer the next question that they're going to have too. So, um, for example, say somebody types in, you know, how to become this type of job or something like that. Um, you know, what questions are they really asking? You know, they might want to learn um, how much does that job pay? They might want to learn, you know, what skills are required to, to do that job. You, they might want to know what the educational requirements for that job is. Um, so you just want to think about all the different questions that somebody will have. Um, that are related to that main blog post um, and then answer all of those questions. That way your post is the most thorough post on that topic and it covers the entire thing. Okay, we had a question come in about um, 
a blog title and how the blog title can change to become social copy. Um, so your blog title is set. You can change some things in uh, metadata if on your uh, blog platform, but that's something a little bit outside today's presentation. Um, but what you can do is alter the t or um, your messaging surrounding the title when you do put it on social. So for example, the uh, mirror example, we could take that and talk about how important it is to practice before a job interview. And we don't have to mention the specific title or even the other one, um, how to prove you're detail oriented in an interview. In the social messaging, you can say, um, these four tips can help you be con or prove that you're more detail oriented in an interview. You can even go as far as breaking those four tips out into four different posts and talking about them that way. So it doesn't always have to include the title when you're doing different messaging. We had another question come in. Um, you know, how can I audit the SEO so I can tell if it's actually working? Um, that's a great question. Um, really, we want to think about the main goal when it comes to SEO, and that is to bring organic traffic back to your site. Um, you know, keyword rankings are great. You know, we have a lot of people who are really concerned about, you know, I want to be, I want to rank number one for this, this, and this. Um, and, and that's all great. But, you know, at the end of the day, the most important, you know, factor when it comes to SEO is that organic traffic. So what I would suggest doing is making sure that you have Google Analytics installed on your website, and that way, and that way you can kind of just you know measure organic traffic coming to the pages that you're optimizing for. That way you can tell if those pages are actually driving traffic back to your site. Uh, we had another question come in. Um, how long does it take for SEO to work, essentially? Um, that's a great question, too. Um, SEO is really a, a long-term process and um, not really a one-time event either. Um, so I'd say whenever you make a change onto on your website your, or you add a new post or anything like that, you know, Google doesn't immediately know that you made a change or added new content right away. So it will take a, a while for Google to first index that result. It can take anywhere from you know, a few days to a few weeks for Google to just index that page so that it's there in their index. And then from there, what they have to do is they have to test that content against all similar web pages around that same topic. That way they can see you know, where should it rank versus the rest of the competition. Um, and really, you know, it can take anywhere from three months to over a year for a post to rank very highly. And really, that just depends on how competitive of a keyword you're trying to target is. So when it comes to um, you know picking the right keywords, you might want to pick something that's a little less competitive, more long tail, a very specific niche down keyword to start, um, rather than typing, rather than trying to like you know optimize for a very um, generic keyword like jobs or something like that, because it's just you know the the more generic keywords are typically more competitive and harder to rank for. Okay, we had a really great question. How do you create a messaging strategy for clients and then another one for candidates? Do you need two separate messaging strategies? And um, I think the, answer, the short answer to this is yes. You need to speak to those two different groups separately, but you also want to keep a consistent um, differenti differentiator across the board. So um, when you speak to clients, you want to show why um, they should work with you, why their job orders will get filled faster, um, why their candidates are better. But then when you talk to candidates, you also want to mention um, the clients that you work with are great. They're going to have a great job working in this great environment. Maybe if it's possible, they're even going to be paid more than um, working with a different company. So those messages have to 
I guess, be similar, but also separate because you're going to be speaking to two separate groups of people. had a question about uh, YouTube and how we can optimize YouTube for the user and for Google. Um, that's a good question. Um, the thing is, if you think about it, Google uh, YouTube is essentially a search engine. In fact, it's actually the number two search engine right after Google, and it's owned by Google. So, you know, um, but the way you can optimize your, your uh, YouTube content is really, um, you know, you can create a video on a topic that is, you know, based on one of your blog posts. So say you have a blog post um, that is already performing well. What you can do is then take that blog post and then create a, a video on that similar topic and then try to have that organically rank in YouTube as well because you know it's a separate search engine, it's a separate index. So that way you can kind of answer that question on multiple different platforms. Um, from there, you can actually take that video and embed it onto your blog post, that way, any traffic that you get from YouTube, you can take that and funnel it back to your website. And then any traffic that comes to your blog post, you can send that over to YouTube as well. And then now you have two different traffic sources kind of feeding into each other. And then the bigger one gets, um, the better everything will rank overall. Plus just having um, YouTube videos in your content, embedded in your content as well. It also um, keeps people on your site for longer um, and that is one of Google's ranking factors. You know, the more the more time someone spends on a web page, um, it, it kind of shows Google that um, people are being engaged on your site, and that is one of the um, key ranking factors that Google is looking for. Um, our presentation is over, but we do have time to answer more questions. So we'll stay on the line for a few more minutes if any want to come in. Had a question come in. Um, can I use Google Trends to, uh, you know, determine if a keyword is um, valuable and worth ranking for? To kind of see how how it works there. Um, the thing with Google Trends, you know, it's very good. It's a very good tool depending on what kind of keywords you're looking for. So, you know, for staffing, I'd say, um, you know, staffing. If you look in Google Trends for something generic like staffing, it's very seasonal. So that's one good thing that Google. Um, that Google Trends is good for. You can kind of see the seasonality. But the thing with that is that, um, you know, it it stays very static in the sense that in the in like the fourth quarter, you'll see that it consistently drops and then it goes up and you, it's cyclical, right? So, um, you know, if you're looking for a general term like staffing, it doesn't really help that much because you'll see that trend, you know, consistently across the board. Um, but if you're looking for, you know, keywords related to, you know, other topics like blog topics, um, Google Trends can be a really good tool to see if, um, that keyword is gaining popularity. If it's on a downtrend, then it may not be a good idea to, to write that post. Um, so yeah, it's definitely something to look at, but it shouldn't be like the main thing that you're looking at.
Okay, our next Lunch with Haley is going to be a product demo for our job board. We're going to talk about what's new. Uh, that's going to be Tuesday, April 16th at 2 p.m., and uh, you can reserve your seat at lunchwithhaley.com. All right, we're going to wrap this up. Thank you, everyone, for listening to us today, and we hope to see you on April 16th.